here's the biggest issue with most of the sales and marketing outreach that I see. It's not getting noticed. It's not standing out from the noise. It's not scroll-stoppingly worthy. And that's because the call openers, the email subject lines, the social posts that most people use are not leveraging pattern interrupts. My guest today has created the most popular sales podcast in the world. So he's an expert at getting noticed and keeping attention with the ultimate long game of pattern interrupts. He's already interrupted me many times as I was getting ready for this podcast, but that's okay. Nick Sigelski, co-host of the 30 Minutes Presidents Club podcast with his co-founder and co-host, and he's with me in studio today, Nick you made it here, man. I made it here, and I'm you so happy to be here. You are here, my um, man. I'm loving it, man. I'm loving it. I, don't, I can't tell if it's just a monster that's going through my veins right now or the fact that I'm excited to see you. I, I suspect it's a little bit of both, but thank you. You're a traveling man. You've been in Poland, Germany, LA, San Francisco, and now you're in Tampa Bay, Florida. Yep. Welcome, man. Thank you. All right, let's play our opening clip that I have for you on pattern interrupts, and I want to get your reaction. Okay. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. I've, I've heard this one. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. Interrupting Moo! Cow. You interrupt. Moo! Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, um, knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting sloth. Interrupting sloth who? You're gonna touch me now. That's, that's good. That's <laughs> Knock, knock. That's Who's there? Interrupting completely uncalled for. Interrupting completely <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, uh, for those that are just listening uh, and not watching <laughs> the video that we just watched, which is from 2006, you could tell it was an old video. Um, there were two guys hanging out at a water cooler, and as you might have heard, the last uh, completely uncalled for joke was he slapped the shit out of his friend. That was, that was brutal, man. <laughs> um, is this how you recommend salespeople use pattern interrupts to prospect to get attention? <sighs> The guy's shirt was actually kind of cool. Like, you know, what I noticed in there was like, yeah, this is definitely 2006, but like that's sort of coming back into style dressing like that. Um, no, okay, physically assaulting a prospect is probably something that isn't going to help you hit your quota yeah, yeah. and might land you in, um, I don't know, a, a slammer. We call, people call it that, the slammer, jail. Uh, no, don't. That's horrible. <laughs> but it was pretty funny. Slap them with your content, not yeah. with your hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so... That was just our fun opening clip. I want to dive into the first segment of the episode with you, the history behind pattern interrupts and using them on cold calls. So truth be told, I spent way too many hours Googling, reading Wikipedia articles on the history of pattern interrupts. And I wanted to share some of the facts that I learned with you, and then you can give us your definition of pattern interrupting in a more of like a sales and like outreach context. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here are my five facts. Fact number one, a pattern interrupt is a tactic developed from neuro-linguistic programming. Mm -hmm. The short form of that is NLP. Neuro-linguistic programming, fact number two, is a pseudoscience from the 70s that has little to no empirically backed evidence to support its bold claims as a cure-all for epilepsy, dyslexia, schizophrenia, depression, and or PTSD. We're going to keep going with these facts. Fact number three, one of the creators of NLP, Richard Bandler, was charged but later acquitted for murder, which involved cocaine, a girlfriend, and a .357 Magnum. I don't know much about guns. Owned by Bandler. Fact number four, pattern interrupts are commonly used by hypnotists along with embedded suggestions, misdirection, and forced unconscious changes. And then finally, fact number five, despite all this, neuro-linguistic programming influenced some useful psychotherapeutic modalities and tactics such as solution-focused therapy or a common one, reframing, that we use mm -hmm. in sales all the time. Mm -hmm. All right. So I just wanted to share that with you as like a foundation. Yeah. I have heard people talk about pattern interrupts, but I never knew where it came from. So there you go. <laughs> Do with that what you will. What's your favorite fact when you just learned? Um, you know, I think I knew that there was like a root in like behavioral um, therapy and like helping people break out of like really negative patterns where it's like, okay, if you if you always eat a donut – 
um, at two o'clock on a Tuesday, yeah, every day at two o'clock, you eat a donut and you're trying to lose weight. Probably shouldn't be eating the donut. And so <laughs> what you might do to like interrupt sort of this um, pattern that you've created for yourself, this habit you've created for yourself is you might ask your buddy, hey, at 159, I need you to do what the guy on that video said to me or like slap me in the face. <laughs> And I'll be like, whoa, you totally get jolted out of it. That, that might not actually be how the behavioral yeah. therapist recommended to be put into action, but I, I sort of knew that background. Um, you want me to talk about sort of how I think it should be used in a sales context? Yes. So I have a belief in sales that you cannot be perceived to be better until you are first perceived to be different. Hmm. And another thing that I think a lot about sales is that most people have a preconceived notion um, of what a salesperson is, of what a seller is. And there's a stigma to being a salesperson. If you go to a party and somebody asks you what they do, you find out, oh, they're an attorney. And then they say, well, what do you do? And you say, oh, well, I sell software. They're like, yeah, I'm going to go get another drink right now. Like, it's not pati- – <laughs> people think, like, salespeople are swindlers or seedy or that there isn't, like – I think the best salespeople are really intentional and thoughtful and like deeply understand the psychology behind selling. And so take those two things that I just said, right? You can't be perceived to be better until you're first perceived to be different. And then also take this stigma that you have to overcome that the other person, your buyer, has about you. And what that creates is the best salespeople must be totally and utterly different than all of the other salespeople out there because otherwise you're living in a world where you blend in with the noise, you don't get your buyer's attention, and if you do somehow manage to get their attention, they still don't trust you. And so when I think about interrupting patterns as a salesperson, I'm constantly thinking about in any situation, whether it's a cold call, a discovery call, we're in a negotiation, I'm meeting somebody in person for the first time, I am always thinking about what would your run-of-the-mill average salesperson do in this situation? situation. And then what I always try to do is just do the opposite of them. And I think that can be really, really effective, not just because you stand out, but it also forces you to critically think about like, what should I actually be doing here? That was an amazing definition. Um, Do you have an example of a pattern interrupt that you've ever used that worked well? Sure. So in a sales context, um, let's, let's get out of just like the cold call or even like, um, let's get out of like the cold call perspective. Let's talk about when you're in a discovery call and you get to the point in that call where maybe the customer shared a little bit about like what they're struggling with or what they hope to achieve. And it's now time for you to explain how your thing could help or what your product or service does. I've seen some salespeople, I've done it myself really, really effectively say, Hey, before I get into the things that we're really great at, let me tell you what we're not great at. Let me tell you where where we're actually very, very weak and what you should not use us for. Hmm. And then list A, B, and C. Here are the main reasons you would not want to work with us. Or here are some preconceived notions people have about what we can help with, and we actually can't. I'm going to tell you those first. And when you do that, what it actually does for the customer is they trust you more because you're leading with, hey, this is where we're not good. I think a lot of salespeople, they have like a lot of bravado, like we're the greatest in the world. We're incredible. I like my product or service can help with anything that you want. You're full of shit. I don't right. believe that's you. That's not, that's not true. And so when you lead with the truth, here's what we're not great at, it sort of disarms the other person. Absolutely. Second, and, and then what happens is it makes when you start telling what you are good at so much more credible because you led with actually your weakness first. Like, Hey, we're actually not very good at these things. Now the customer, they're like, okay, well, what are you good at? And they're going to believe and trust that. And so um, I think that's one of the most effective uses that I've seen is like, hey, before we get into this demo, like these are the things that we're not very good at. Or like we have some competitors who are better equipped to solve these things over here. Hmm. Now, if you're in that demo and the thing that was most important to them you learned in the discovery call is the thing that you're not very good at. Like you probably shouldn't be in the demo. And ideally what ends up happening is those things that you're not great at are the things that the customer doesn't even really care about anyways. And so it actually doesn't hurt you at all to say, hey, we're not very good at these things, but it still makes them trust and believe and say, all right, this person's going to give it to me straight. Um, I could give you 800 more examples there, but you look like you have a question on the tip of your tongue. I do. Okay. Which is, I have two pattern interrupts that my teammates recorded that they have used on cold calls to try to sell PandaDoc software. Let's see them. Let's hear them. I want you to hear them and then get your reaction to them. Let's do it. Hey, Travis. This is Steven. Listen, my mom told me if I ever needed to interrupt somebody, I had to ask for permission. Do you have 27 seconds for me to tell you why I called? 
All right, so that's the first one. And then I've got the second one. This one's from, uh, the first one, sorry, was from Steven from PandaDoc. And the next one is from Gabe from PandaDoc. Hey, Brittany, I'll come clean with you. This is a sales call. Uh, do you want to hang up now or give me 30 seconds to tell you what I'm calling? So they just recorded this on Slack and yep. sent it to me. It's yep. not from an actual call. I think Gabe probably would have had more enthusiasm. Maybe not. Um, but I I like both of those. Yep. Why what do you think of those pattern interrupts and do they work or not work or what would you do differently? Yeah, a, a couple things that they did really well there. Um, both of them acknowledged the fact that this was indeed a cold call. Actually, let's go back to the first pattern interrupt that I talked about where it's like, here's the things that we're not great at. They're leading with almost this disarming honesty. I'm not trying to trick you and be like, well, how have you been, Travis? Because we don't know each other. This is a cold call. I am super, super upfront that we do not know each other. I want, when I'm making a cold call, to orient the other person very quickly around the type of interaction that this is. And if you don't, which what they did in the clip really well, if you don't say, hey, this is indeed a cold call. We don't know each other. You run the risk of confusing them, and then they're not oriented around, okay, this is someone I haven't spoken with who wants to get a meeting with me. And the sooner they can orient around that context, the more easily you can actually book a sales meeting. But then two, the other thing you run the risk of is them accusing you of being dishonest. And you never want that to happen. You never want to lead with dishonesty as a salesperson. So you're you're actually being disarmingly honest in that scenario. The other thing, they both sort of inserted a little bit of humor in there, right? My mother said, if I have to interrupt someone, I need to ask permission. That's <laughs> funny and it's true, yeah. right? And most salespeople are not saying that stuff. 98% of salespeople, when they make a cold call, they say, hey, Travis, did I catch you at a bad time? It's a cold call. Of course, it's a bad time. Or worse, they say, Travis, this is Nick Sigelski. How are you today? You know I don't care how you are today. I'm calling 47 other CFOs this afternoon, <laughs> right? You can't try to convince me you care about the individual days of each of those people. And so what they did is they led with something that was like, that you, they were clearly having a fun time. At least the first guy was. The other guy, right. It was a little lower energy. That would be my thing. Like, But you don't want to be extremely happy-go-lucky. Like, hey, Travis, my mother said, like, I mean, I guess that would pattern interrupt, but <laughs> I'm always a little bit wary of the salesperson that is uber enthusiastic. I think a little bit more like high energy measured approach. Like the first guy was phenomenal. So there was sort of the mother line, right? That's funny. It gets their attention. And then both of them also asked for a specific amount of time. I liked the 27 seconds better because, again, it inserts that sort of like playful element You're there. Like, You've timed this to 27 seconds, Stephen? Exactly. You clown, let's go. Exactly. It's like... Again, it takes them out of the, like, can I get a minute to tell you why I called this? Can I get yeah. 27 seconds? Yeah. And then what I will do, because I'll use a similar opener to that, is like, I'll say, and you know what? You could even start a timer if you would like to. I want them to lean and be like, even if they're not interested in the product or service, or even if they don't like taking cold calls, I promise them my commitment that I've signaled, I mean, those clips were what, like six seconds long? I have signaled in six seconds that at the very least, you're going to get a chuckle out of this interaction. And that is a really powerful pattern interrupt. I love it, man. All right, let's move on to what's your best advice for someone who might be new to pattern interrupts? Yep. You said 98% of salespeople are not doing some of these you know, these things. What's keeping them from... I, I'm wondering if, like, if you're just new to this and you're like, all right, I listen to Nick, I listen to Travis, yep. I've listened to some of the other podcasts out there. I want to start doing some of my own pattern interrupts. What advice do you have for them? I said it earlier, but any time that you are about to take an action, make a cold call, put together a proposal, send a sales email, do a demo, meet with the customer in person, think for a second about what would your run-of-the-mill average salesperson do in this situation. Your run-of-the-mill average salesperson is not going to say, hey, my mother said that any time I interrupt someone, I need to ask permission, right? So think about what the average will do and then find a way to do it differently. Find a way to do the opposite. Um, you know, you go on LinkedIn right now and you'll see tons of buyers complaining about their interactions with salespeople. Well, that what that tells me is that the status quo, um, the flip side of the coin is probably much, much better. So find a way to do do things differently. Um, it, it's sort of simple to say, but yeah. do, do the opposite. Well, one thing I'll add to that is I think a lot of, like, if you ask most people about what they want their, this is one step above sort of like a sales context, but if you ask most people, like, what do you want your life to be like? Most people will say, I want a special life. I want an extraordinary life. I want like a better than average life. Yet most people, if you look at their behavior, they follow the crowd. They want to fit in, 
right? Like when I was in middle school, I really, really wanted to fit in. So you dress the same, you look the same, like you do the same things. Um, and by definition, if you follow the crowd and you try to blend in and do the same thing as everyone else, you cannot have an extraordinary special life. And so um, it, it's always this sort of constant pull away from inertia the, or gravity almost that's pulling you back to the mass. Um, and so I think you almost have to proactively fight against that, not just in sales, but in life. I love that. Yeah. I'm having flashbacks to me wearing and one basketball shorts, <laughs> and Air Force Ones. I'm and- thinking of a nice shirt with a big moose on it, my Abercrombie <laughs> shirt. <laughs> My mom wouldn't take me to Abercrombie because it was too expensive, so <laughs> we had to settle for American Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> Abercrombie was too sexy with those yeah. m- those teenage boys <laughs> put their shirts on. All right. Um, I want to show you one other pattern interrupt that I really liked, mm-hmm. and it's from Dale Dupree, who we recently here at PandaDoc mentioned as one of our um, top sales influencers, along mm-hmm. with yourself. Um, let's take a look at Dale's, and then I want to just break it down real quick. Let's do it. Yo, what's up? This is Dale Dupree with the Sales Rebellion. And look, this is a cold call, but the good news is I'm not calling about your car's extended warranty. And I'm not trying to sell you a timeshare. People go, <laughs> I get that all the time. What's up? Right? So what are you calling about? Typically, I'd leave my, my company name out entirely. And I only use Dale Dupree because a long time ago when I played music, somebody said, your name sounds like a celebrity. So that's actually from our friends over at Sales Feed and Vidyard. They put that together. <laughs> so shout out to them and shout out to Dale Dupree. Um, I don't want to get too repetitive why we think this one works well, because I feel like we've kind of covered that, but I, I, I think I'm wanting to give our audience like as many examples as possible so yep. that they, they start to understand. Cause if they walk away from this and they're just going to say, well, I'm just going to tell them this is a cold call. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's a great first step. Yep. But what is to me <laughs> and listening to you and, and what you just described is like, what can I do? Me that no one else can do. Mm, okay. Or very few people can think of themselves. Yep. So I'll give you the formula to have the like a cold call opener that no one else will, will copy and use. Okay. Right. Um, one, let's talk about what Dale did, Dale did there. And he's like the ultimate at pattern interrupts. I've seen him do some awesome, cool stuff, like crumple up a sales letter and mail it to a customer. <laughs> what is this? Somebody mailed me a, like a, and, and he literally writes in the letter, you know, most sales letters get crumpled up and thrown in the trash. So I did it for you. Like, he's so good at that stuff. I think it's really brilliant. Um, what he did was he made a commentary about like the sort of the status quo there. So I talked about doing the opposite of the status quo. He just made a comment. He's like, hey, I'm actually not going to do what most people do on these cold calls, which is try to sell you a car warranty or I forget what he's, some student loans or something, right? So we pointed out that like all those other guys are over here. I'm over here. I'm not going to do that thing. And so I think that was really, really intelligent. What he also sort of um, subconsciously does there is he puts himself in a different space. I think some salespeople, like I talk to a lot of salespeople that use what's called a, and I promise I'll answer the magic formula, they use a permission-based opener. Mm -hmm. And a permission-based opener sounds something like, hey, Travis, this is Nick Sigelski with 30 Minutes to President's Club. I know you didn't expect me to call you this afternoon. Do you mind if I take one minute, I'll tell you what I'm calling you about, and then you can tell me whether or not it makes sense for us to speak. That has been my sales call opener for a very, very long time. But the problem with that is the customer has no idea what you are calling about there. And so you get lumped in when I use that opener I just said with all of the other car warranty, student loan, IRS is suing you, scammers and cold callers out there. And so what Dale immediately did there was he put himself on a different plane because he sells something that's like a legitimate business. Hmm. So I actually like his cold opener much better than like what I have historically coached folks to stay at, say in the past. Um, all you have to do if you want the formula for an opener that's going to stand out is comment on something about the circumstances. So let's just go back to that permission-based opener where it's okay. like, um, let's use the one that I said, which is that permission-based opener. Hey, Travis, I know you didn't expect me to call you this afternoon. You could say something like, hey, Travis, this is Nick Sigelski with 30 Minutes of President's Club. I know you didn't expect me to call you at 347 on a Friday afternoon when it's pouring rain in Clearwater because I know you're based or you're in Clearwater today, right? I guess we're in St. Peter, Petersburg. Anyways, <laughs> let me read you that one. So I would say like like often – hopefully you're doing like some – tiny element of research and you know where the other person is based or you know something about the other person that you can point out. Like, if I know that you normally host a podcast, 
I might say when I call you, hey, Travis, this is Nick Sigelski with 30 Minutes to President's Club. I know I'm catching you out of the blue, and I hope you're not walking into the podcast studio right now to record a customer engagement lab podcast. Do you mind if I take 28 seconds to tell you why I'm calling you, right? I'm commenting on something that I found out about the other person that is unique to them. Hmm. I like that. And no one else is going to do that. I mean, okay, maybe someone else will do that, but you're probably going to get three of those cold calls in your entire life. So I think the formula is in your opener, insert something about the other person because that makes it totally unique. I like it. I like it. Let's move on to pattern interrupts. Let's do it. For email. (laughs) Talked about cold calling. We've heard from Dale, Stephen, Gabe. We've heard from you. Now it's time to look at the written word. Ooh. Will Allred, who's my good friend from Lavender, he's got a TikTok that we're gonna look at here real quick. Are your cold emails starting just like this? If so, I've got a great pattern interrupt that you can put into place right now. If I had to guess, every single one of your sales emails starts the exact same way. It starts with hi, and then the recipient's first name. It might be hey, might be hello, whatever. And if you're writing a high quality cold email, you're going to personalize that with an observation at the front. Now here's the pattern break. Move the observation into the greeting. This makes your message feel more conversational, informal. It makes it feel honestly more internal, like it came from someone within the company. A super small change to make your cold email stand out. So for those that are just listening and and can't see this, I'm having a little hard time as well seeing it because it's a little far away from me, but... He replaced the high name greeting yep. with the, what was it, the question? Yeah, so what it said was the the email, I'll tell you what he's doing. So okay. um, the first email said, hi, Will, how's it going with the new reps, right? This person was prospecting Will because it was clear that he had hired some new reps and they that was a trigger for the thing that they sell. And Will's recommendation here is, you still want to have the person's name in a place that they can see in the preview text of the email to show that it's like designed for them and not just a mass blast. Mm-hmm. But he's he's saying he's advocating for moving that sort of greeting of their name to the end. So instead of hi Will, how's it going with the new reps? It's how's it going new, with the new reps? Will. All Got he's it. doing is he's moving the name to the back half of it, which it it the structure, the visual structure. It's like a it. friend reaching out to you. Correct. Because I wouldn't say like, hey Nick. Yep. If you and I were already buddies and Correct. texting all the time. Correct. I mean, only if you hadn't heard of, heard from me in like right. six months or something. Yes. Or, but you, you wouldn't have a comma and a line break, right? Like, no. I think that's an area a lot of salespeople screw things up. Again, like, I mean, use a dash or something or don't put it in there at all or use all lowercase. Like, there's a lot of things we could do with a written word and I think we're going to talk about it now. We are, which is I signed up for the 30 Minutes of President's Club emails Ooh. that I don't know if you're writing them. I don't know if Armand is writing them. Or somebody from your team is writing them, but I really like them. And um, this is especially for my marketers out there that are struggling uh, with personalizing subject lines. But there were two that I really liked. The first one is, Nick will be your personal sales assistant. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) And um, the next one is, we've been trying to reach you about your deal's extended warranty. And there are plenty more that are just absolutely ridiculous. Like some of them make fun of you. And mm-hmm. I'm like, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. And I, what I did actually was I typed in, I think I typed in like President's Club to try to find these emails. Yes. Because I get them weekly or monthly. Yeah. And I'd been getting a, mu- a bunch of them. And I looked at those subject lines compared to all the other ones that were popping up. Yep. In my, and I was, they were all stacked against each other. And all the 30 Minutes of President's Club's ones were open. That mm. I opened them, mm-hmm. and I I don't open a lot of emails. Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, I think it's a great pattern interrupt, and I was it was especially visual for me to be able to see like not throwing anyone under the bus here, but other like sales content organizations, yeah. and they just it was like three hot tips yeah. for your you know join us in our webinar for the three three hot tips and it's like I open these and I'm like I honestly don't know where the fuck Armand's going with this yeah. I'm like what personal assistant yep. he mentioned Nick I know Nick yep. or like you know using humor we've been trying to reach you about your deals extended warranty so that's my breakdown of why these work so well is it just about being funny is there more to it? Like, what do you think is going on here? I mean, there's a lot going on with why somebody actually opens an email newsletter. True. 
you clearly are getting value of the sub out of the substance of the email. And we, I mean, we think really, really deeply around what should actually be in that newsletter. I mean, Armand and I have probably gone through four or five different revisions. Like we've spent hours debating with each other about what should go in there. Because I think when most people put together a newsletter, it's like, all right, like let's just cram all of our links or put all of our stuff. And um, I don't know, from my perspective, I start with the customer in mind. Like I start with you in mind. I want you to smile and sort of chuckle when you see that. Yeah. Um, but I also want it to be related to what is in the the you know the email. It's not a bait and switch here. Like the personal sales assistant one, that was promoting a – um, webinar, and we don't call them webinars, again, because I want to break the pattern. We call them tactic teardowns. Everybody does webinars. We don't do webinars. We do tactic teardowns. And we were promoting a tactic teardown where I was going to show my sales calendar and talk through how salespeople should run their sales day and sales week to get the most juice for their squeeze. But the idea was like, hey, I'll be your personal sales assistant. And then yeah. it sort of continued on. And it was like, <laughs> actually, that'd be a bad idea. He talks way too much. <laughs> but he is he has learned a thing or two about how to manage his sales day. You might want to join us for this tactic teardown. So that was sort of the idea behind it. Um, no, of course, it's not just about being funny. Um, I think we built some trust with the audience and think they know that, okay, this is going to start funny. But like this is actually going to have some some value in there. So I don't know if I could – give you more detail about like the intentionality behind the the subject line in preview text though. No, I think that's a that's a good enough explanation for me. I think what I'm interested in as well is like what else can sellers and marketers do with their emails to kind of stop someone in their tracks and make them open and interact. And I will share a story of where I I messed up. I went too far mm -hmm. in trying to pattern interrupt. Yeah. And it was a lesson that I want to share with my audience because I think it's always good to understand like where is the line, yeah. right? Like my line is very different from other people's, but I sent out an email blast. Um, I want to say it was like right as the pandemic was kicking off. Yep. And I think I had too much caffeine that day. I was uh, I was hyped up. Yep. And this is also why I don't write emails for PandaDoc anymore. Like they've, <laughs> oh they've moved my role away from that one. Yeah. Um, I wrote a subject line that says, I hope you lose your job. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It didn't go well. Um, I had to issue a formal apology. Yep. I had to apologize to a number of people individually that yep. were on, our, on this email blast. Yeah. I do apologize to... My employer, I apologize to my bosses. Uh, it didn't go over well. It was me trying to be funny. Yep. And it was me focusing on funny and not putting myself in the customer's shoes. Mm. It was literally just going full-blown clickbait. Yep. And it backfired terribly. So yep. that was my lesson that I wanted to share with the audience about like when pattern up interrupting goes wrong. Yeah. <laughs> can I can I give some commentary on that? For One, sure, man. Uh, it takes a lot to stand up in, in front of a you know a lot of people and say, I screwed up. So Thanks. um credit to you and as Hannah Montana says everybody makes mistakes <laughs> <laughs> thanks Hannah Montana the other thing that I'll say and I think you're right where you made an error here is there is a difference between attention and reputation mm -hmm. and you can slap somebody at the water cooler you can send an email like that and you can get people's attention yeah but you have to also sort of begin with the end in mind anytime you want attention like what's the attention for what exactly. do you want to point the attention at and so I could think of a lot of inappropriate things that I could do today that would get a lot of attention on LinkedIn and I'd probably get my account deleted and you know no one would ever want to work with me again. So yeah. I think the thing to keep in mind is like how do you get attention in a way that also when people see it, they say, oh, and it sort of bolsters. It's that deposit into your um, – are you familiar with the term relationship bank account? I am. Okay. So it's a deposit into like – you know if. The 10 second summary is with every person, like individuals in your life and your audience, you have a bank account. And when you have a give, it's a deposit into the account. And when you have a take, it's a withdrawal. So that email you shared was a withdrawal. But you can build that bank account back up. And so um, I think you should always be thinking about, yeah, I'm going to get attention on this, but is this a deposit or a withdrawal? Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. And it was definitely, yeah, it was a withdrawal. I think um, it ended up spurring some really good conversations too. Yeah. Um, so, I think, the, yeah, another lesson there for folks, too, who are just like, well, I'm listening to this. I want to learn from Nick about pattern interrupting. Um, I think it's a good lesson to learn where, yeah, you do something for just to get attention. What, yep. are, you, what are you doing with that attention? So yep. well said, man. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs>
And let's go into the last segment of the episode, section three, pattern interrupts for content and the framework to create new ones. So I found this awesome article from Carmen, I'm going to try to say his last name, Mastro Piero, who is a freelance copywriter, is an awesome blog post that has some examples and explains pattern interrupting from a marketing and content standpoint, which I know your expertise is in sales, but you, my friend, have one of the best podcasts in the world, so you're now a content marketer, whether you like it or not. I've realized that recently. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at his article here. He starts out with a headline. Here is, HEY! All capitals, H-E-Y, exclamation point. Pattern Interrupt Copywriting Guide for Stealing Attention. He starts out with, hi, my name is Carmen, and this is a goldfish. And then he gets a giphy of a goldfish. Why am I telling you this? Because that goldfish has taught me a lot about copywriting. Not actually. I just wanted to get your attention, and that's exactly what I'm going to be teaching you today, how to use Pattern Interrupt Copywriting for getting people to read your copy. And so... Yeah, what do you think makes 30 Minutes to President's Club stand out as a podcast and as a brand? Just using this as like a primer and a foundation of like content and pattern interrupting. Because you guys do a good job of it. You have a huge following and it's not just because you're doing the same thing as everyone else. Can I ask you a question about that question? Sure. What has stood out to you about the content that we create? I love your branding. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that... What has stood out to me is, besides the branding and the, the colors mm -hmm. being fun and approachable and mm -hmm. energized, which I think is the show, I think it goes back to um, what I was talking about with your emails that you and Armand put together. Mm -hmm. And it's funny and intelligent. Mm -hmm. And that's part of myself that I want to improve. Yeah. And it's a part of a community that I identify with and want to feel like I'm surrounded by those types of people too. I think it's so fascinating that that is what has stood out to you. And part of the reason I'm really fascinated by that is, I don't like this term, but I'm going to use it anyway, the value proposition. The biggest thing that makes 30 Minutes to President's Club different, I think, is that I'll talk about two things. So it's not really the biggest thing. I think they're two biggest things. Most sales podcasts that you go listen to, um, it's an hour-long episode, and two guys will come on, and they'll have a conversation about sales, but they might start the first four minutes talking about the weather or joking about sports, and you know they'll ask, Nick, how are you doing today? And Nick will share too much information. And <laughs> now you get seven minutes into the recording, and yeah. Nick starts saying stuff like, well, you know, you just got to sell value. You got to have empathy. You got to be a hard worker. You have to listen to the customer. And it's you like, might, dude, get to the point. Well, they never do. I think there are a <laughs> lot of like platitudes that I hear in sales where it's like, you got to get on the same side of the table as a customer. And what does that mean to like a 22 year old brand new salesperson? They don't, they don't know how to do that. And so we made a really intentional decision around like the branding and the angle of 30 Minutes to President's Club that we have a really fierce commitment to only exclusively talking about things that salespeople can do, say, or write that very day. That's step one. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you how like ruthless we are with this. We record with our guests for an hour, and we only publish 30 minutes of the interview. Because as any conversation goes, just like this one, there's times that like I ramble about a point for too long, and the audience is probably listening to this and being like, "Oh yeah, earlier I wish he would just like have moved on and let let Travis Tyler get a, get a question in, right?" Mm -hmm. Well, that happens in every conversation, in every interview, and oftentimes the reason people repeat themselves is like in a conversation is they're checking for understanding with the other person, which is fine, but the 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 viewer or the listener in post like once you get to the post production like they don't need that point made two three four times and Your so poor editors they yeah have so much editing it's to an do. extreme amount of work <laughs> it is an extreme amount of work um, there are times that we record with guests and we don't publish the episode yeah. and that's a really hard decision to make it's a painful decision to make yeah. and it's led to uncomfortable situations um, my most important customer is the audience and the trust with that audience is the most important thing to me and so. I think those are two of the things that make a really, really big difference. We push guests really hard. We don't let them show up without having done pretty substantial prep. Um, we, we, we end up cutting so it's only the highlights of the show. And if something doesn't meet, like 
that's part of the reason that you trust the brand. Yeah. You open those emails because you know every single one of them is going to have something that you can use and learn and it's at least going to make you smile. And so I think one other thing that I'll add is we don't try to do too many things. I think a lot of people are like, oh, you guys should launch a YouTube channel and you guys should start doing a sales training course. And well, what if you also consulted or, or you know, did big speaking engagements? And we might eventually do some of those things, but I just, I think too many people think let's take the peanut butter approach and spread it all over the wall and do everything. When in reality, like, I just want to do one thing really, really well. I could keep giving you more examples of some ideas around that, but you have probably have other questions. And this is the point where I'm like, oh, we would have this part of the interview. <laughs> no, dude. The only thing I, I thought of that I didn't want to lose as I was listening to you is part of a pattern interrupt yeah. that I've learned in just talking with you is, is this ruthless um, dedication to the product you're delivering or the service you're delivering to the end user. Yep. So when I think of, we're talking about content in this segment, right? We talked about cold calling, emailing, now we're talking about content. One of the first like, um, content writers to do this pattern interrupt really well was The Morning Brew, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know, where are you? Why are you living under a rock? But The Morning Brew, years ago, like 2015, I was reading their emails and nobody was writing emails like these guys. Yep. And... I still read them occasionally, but I do think there is something which tangentially might become a different conversation about like, I think they have too many newsletters now. They have mm. like 12 different newsletters. Yep. I think that's a little diluted of a product now. Um, and I only subscribe to the the, the tried and true morning brew pot, um, email blast that I get. And that is part of pattern interrupting yep. is like the dedication to like the consistency and the quality that you're delivering. Yeah. And it, yeah, I, I had never thought of that before. And that is such a key component to it. So, I mean, it goes in line with what we said about do the opposite, right? There are lots of like, I don't know, you would call them sales media companies out there that try to do a lot of things. And so it's, it's hard for me because again, like there's that sort of gravitational pull to like want to follow the crowd a little bit. And it helps that I have a co-founder who we both can sort of hold each other accountable where it's like, hey, we're, because like, yeah. there's weeks I'm like, man, we should be doing this. And he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> and so I think that's part of our, our strategy. A, a, an analogy that I'll use is like, I'm going to go all the way back to, to my experience in high school mm -hmm. where I think there's a lot of high school students that think that when they're applying to college is they have to have a resume where they did everything. I was part of the French club and I played three sports and I also volunteered at the community center and I also like did this summer internship and they overload themselves. And so they end up doing a ton of things, but they do like a B, B minus job at everything. When in reality, I think the people that get the most attention are the people that do just one thing. And because like most people had the same sort of like resources in terms of like work capacity and like even intelligence in some ways. But when you, when you compress all of your sort of cognitive resources and time and attention into doing just one thing really, really well, now you do an A plus, 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 plus job. Like I, I can play a couple strings on the guitar, but like no one's listening to me play guitar because I'm not the best in the world. Like most people want to consume the best in the world of things. Yeah. And so you don't go to your average burger shop. You go to like the best cheese. Like when I was looking up food in St. Petersburg, I was like, where's the best place to eat? Right. <laughs> I'm looking yeah. up the best place to eat. People yeah, want yeah. the best. And so you shouldn't do the spread it everywhere approach. I love it, man. I'm going to end this with a pattern interrupt. Oh boy. Are you ready for this? I'm going to break something. I just want to hold your hands across the table. I, I'm kind of short. We might not be able to reach. For those that are just watching and just listening, we're, we're, I just wanted oh, yeah. him to remember this. It's sort of like a weird handshake. I mean, we can interlock <laughs> fingers. If... And my hands are so sweaty and yours are so like nice and calm. Oh, uh, well, I use a lot of lotion. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just want to end it on a fun note, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. This was great. Um, you can find Nick wherever you get your podcast, 30 Minutes to Presidents Club. You can find him on LinkedIn. Um, subscribe to his newsletter. Hang out with him. Fly him out to your podcast if you want. Don't hold hands with him because um, that's only something that I can do as a pattern interrupt. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for listening to the Customer Engagement Lab brought to you by PandaDoc. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or connect with us on LinkedIn. 
We love to hear from you and what you think of the show. 